lot of the changes to it over that time have had to do with trying to keep it relevant. Um, adding in the 1930s talent so that it wasn't just a beauty contest. Adding in the 1940s scholarships so that women were winning something beyond money or furs or cars or as in the 20s, uh, as often was the case, film contracts. And then in, the, in 1990, uh, social issues platforms or the social issues platform was added, which required that the women adopt a cause. Um, anti-bullying or literacy or addiction awareness, um, some some socially valuable issue that they stood behind. And so each of those things, building up to 2018 when the swimsuit was eliminated uh, for, you know, because it was just so antiquated to have women doing this, although not, not every pageant fan uh, supported that, I think they're pretty evenly split or significantly split in any case. That was the last major change that, again, would either propel it forward and modernize it or destroy it because it completely ripped it from its roots from the, of the 1920s. Love it or detest it, the Miss America pageant has been the source of controversy since its beginnings in the 1920s. Author and educator Margot Mifflin joins John and Scoop in the virtual studio to discuss her new book, Looking for Miss America, a pageant's 100-year quest to define womanhood. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest in our ongoing series, uh, infinitely ongoing series of Plutopia podcasts. Our guest today is Margot Mifflin. Uh, Margot is an author and journalist who writes about women's history and the arts. She's also a professor in the English department of Lehman College at uh, City University of New York, and she teaches arts journalism at uh, City University's Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. She wrote the first history of women's tattoo culture, uh, Bodies of Subversion, A Secret History of Women in Tattoo, and also The Blue Tattoo, The Life of Olivia Oatman. And her new book, the one that we're going to be talking about today, is called Looking for Miss America, a pageant's 100-year quest to define womanhood. And it's uh, the first feminist cultural history of the Miss America pageant. So welcome, Margo. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. And uh, I guess my first uh, kind of obvious question is, were you a fan of the Miss America pageant yourself when, you know, when, when you were younger? Well, I guess like anybody of a certain generation, it was embedded in your consciousness or in my consciousness, um, because it was, a, a, you know, growing up in the, in the 70s, as a teenager in the 70s, um, it had just hit its peak. And so I think anybody from that era was aware of it as, as this national phenomenon. And I guess as one of our last truly national phenomena in the sense that um, for those who were interested in it, it, you know, everybody interested or not knew when it happened and knew that it was this huge pop culture event. So I wasn't really a fan though I was aware of it. Um, and what happened was I wasn't even aware that it still existed for a while before I started researching the book. I just stumbled on it on TV in maybe 2014, 2015, around there, and could not believe what I was seeing, women in swimsuits parading around on stage, competing with each other to become America's most beautiful woman. And I just thought, well, how, did, how does this still exist? Uh, how, who competes, why do they compete, who watches, and what does it mean? It's different from other pageants in the sense that it presumes to represent um, America and uh, on some level, uh, national pride. And so that's, uh, I, I, the last question to, to uh, wrap that up is that I wondered why nobody uh, had written about it, why no feminist critic had explored it as a, a historical event that had been going on for almost a hundred years. Well, it also, it, it really traces the trajectory of, of uh, the perception of women throughout the last, how many years is that? That's like a hundred years, really. It's a yeah, hundred years old. 
next year will be its 100th anniversary. Margot, I was impressed, very impressed by the amount of research you went through before even starting the book. I, when I got to the end of the book, I was, you know, floored by the bibliography and acknowledgments. This wasn't just a casual project. How long did you spend and how, how challenging was the research process? It was pretty challenging. It was really fun in the beginning because I was just doing historical research for I'd say four, three or four years on top of teaching full time. And then I had a sabbatical to finally write. And so in the course of the last year before it was published, I did all the interviews, interviewed Miss Americas and state winners and local contestants and wrote the book. So I will say it's the, it's, it's the fastest writing I've ever done. I'm not the fastest writer, but I had a deadline and, and it wasn't just uh, the, the, the deadline that Counterpoint Press had established for me. It was also that the, the 100th anniversary was coming. So I knew I couldn't push this uh, beyond that. And I ideally wanted it to come out before the anniversary. And also I wasn't really sure it was gonna survive after the, the 2018 pageant was kind of a, uh, a pivot point where it was redesigned and a lot of changes were made and it was unclear whether it would survive after that point or if those changes would make it survive. Well, that was actually, I have a list of questions and the last question on my list kind of fits right now. Uh, did it feel like you were writing an obituary for the pageant? It did feel like that. And I think, uh, I think it was a review, the review in the New York Times book review, the reviewer said it, it, it's, it reads like an obituary only because it traces, you know, the, the historical sort of tentacles of it go into pop culture history, feminist culture history, um, political history. And uh, it, it just, it, you know, it, it, it's stretching out over the course of a century. And uh, I actually just totally forgot what your question was. I'm sorry. <laughs> whether it read like an obituary or whether oh, it yeah. felt like an obituary. Right, yeah. And so over the course of the, the, the research and writing about the its evolution over the past century, um, a lot of the changes to it over that time have had to do with trying to keep it relevant. Um, adding in the 1930s talent so that it wasn't just a beauty contest. Adding in the 1940s scholarships so that women were winning something beyond money or furs or cars, or as in the 20s, uh, as often was the case, film contracts. And then in, the, in 1990, uh, social issues platforms or the social issues platform was added, which required that the women adopt a cause, um, anti-bullying or literacy or addiction awareness, um, some, some socially valuable issue that they stood behind. And so each of those things building up to 2018 when the swimsuit was eliminated uh, for you know, because it was just so antiquated to have women doing this, although not not every pageant fan uh, supported that. I think they're pretty evenly split or significantly split in any case. That was the last major change that, again, would either propel it forward and modernize it or destroy it because it completely ripped it from its roots from the, of the 1920s. Probably the only way it could survive Sam Haskell, right? Right, yeah. Sam Haskell really did a number on it by slut shaming and fat shaming. The executive director, I think that was his title, slut shaming, uh, fat shaming, just generally insulting actual Miss America title holders and contestants as well. Uh, he had to step down because comments he made or conversations he participated in were um, exposed. and. Uh, that was pretty much the biggest scandal since, I guess, Vanessa Williams, <laughs> who was, you know, one of the most, um, one of the greatest and most famous Miss Americas, but also represented a scandalous period in Miss America because naked photos of her were published in Penthouse and she was asked to step down. And then Richard that's, Carlson that's was quite uh, controversial Sorry. as well. Uh, as the, well, so Gretchen Carlson was a Miss America and then became the, uh, der, uh, the 
board chair, I guess, uh, uh, when those when that major change, the swimsuit, hap the elimination of the swimsuit happened. So so yeah, she was controversial because because of that split. Some people thought this was a great thing and would bring it into the modern era, and other people thought it was a betrayal of everything Miss America had been. Oh, we lost some sound. I'm not hearing oh, it. Oh, John's. Uh, oh, sorry about that. I was muted and lost track. Oh, of no worries. I was muted. Um, and I'm sure Scoop can cut this piece out. Um, so uh, I think uh, I'd be interested in kind of talking about the beginnings of the, of the pageant, kind of where it came from, how it got started. Uh, which I think was, what was that, 1921? It was like just right after women's suffrage happened? Right, just after women had won the vote. And ostensibly, it was just a sort of commercial venture in Atlantic City. It, it was part of a festival called the Fall Festival that was intended to extend the summer tourist season into fall. And, and so keep tourists in Atlantic City a couple weeks longer. And so it was very shrewd in the sense that it cashed in on the evolution of swimwear. Women had around the turn of the century been wearing these heavy woolen dresses that fully concealed their bodies. And even in some cases uh, were wheeled out into the water in these strange devices called bathing machines that permitted them to get out in the surf without being seen wet. And so there was a pretty sort of speedy evolution in the early 20th century in swimwear in response to women's greater athleticism. So the Miss America pageant saw this and figured, let's cash in on this. We can see women in their swimsuits. Everybody wants to see a beautiful woman, especially in a swimsuit. And, and these were scandalous at the time. It was, it was you know, new, newly permitted but it wasn't necessarily fully accepted. And it's kind of fun to read about how the early women were, uh, actually the, the, the women were showing their bare knees, which was not typical. There were different beach rules around the country, but in Atlantic City at that time, it was not acceptable to wear uh, swimwear without stockings rolled up over the knee to conceal, yeah, you, know, you could only show basically a couple inches of flesh on the knee. But the rules in Atlantic City were relaxed for the Miss America pageant. And so there's this funny kind of a push-pull of their, the pageant is recognizing the, the fashion progress of the time, uh, but, but also, you know, one woman, for example, who competed in the pageant a day later was arrested on the beach for showing the exact same amount of skin she had worn in the pageant. So uh, it was sort of touch and go, but then it was also interesting because it was progressive in the sense of recognizing fashion progress, but at the same time, not really recognizing social progress. Women had won the vote, they were um, out in public, you know, marching, claiming their rights, and yet the Miss America pageant rewarded women who were girlish and basically the most marriageable pretty women out there, which sort of segued into eugenics of that period, anxiety about immigration. Actually, even since I wrote the book, um, the, uh, the 1918 epidemic apparently triggered people's anxieties about good health. So. If, if I'm reading correctly, eugenics was partly happening in response to that. But in the Miss America contest, it was about what woman represents, best represents American womanhood, um, healthy, young, marriageable, potential mother was, was what was on display there. And it had evolved a little bit out of um, better baby contests where babies were displayed and judged and it emerged that people were as interested in looking at their mothers as the babies themselves. So there was a, a you know, this, this sort of surface purpose of extending the tourist season. And then there was this social uh, purpose of keeping women in this feminine sphere. And of course, 
making them compete with each other at a time when women in the public sphere were now increasingly competing with men. The uh, commercialization of uh, the pageant was uh, indicated by the whole swimsuit thing. It was sponsored for a while by Catalina, which was a swimsuit maker. But there were many commercial tie-ins. Was that more of the focus of the organizers to be a commercial engine for Atlantic City and for their sponsors? Yes, and it was mainly the, the, the work of the formative um, executive director, Lenora Slaughter, who was a really interesting character who came along in the 30s and realized it was very tacky at that point. It, people were um, recruiting from like local fairs and uh, there, there was not really any sort of admission standards in place for the, the women and girls. Many of them were girls. The first Miss America was 16 when she won. But Lenora Slaughter recognized that it, it needed a sort of upclassing. And she's the one who secured the sponsors who would fund it, Catalina being a key one, and Catalina also being a very significant one historically, because not only did they um, provide the swimsuits, and some of their swimwear was really beautiful too, uh, but in 1950, there was a really rebellious Miss America, who's one of my favorite characters in the book, Yolan Betbees, who refused to wear the swimsuit during her reign year and announced the day after she was crowned, I'm not gonna do this, I'm an opera singer. She had performed very successfully and was one of the few Miss Americas who had been asked to, uh, to do two encores uh, of her performance. She told the sponsors, I'm not doing it. And she had conveniently forgotten to sign the binding contract that would force her to do it. So Lenora Slaughter kind of went along with this. I think she was secretly horrified, but she, she figured that too could help upclass it. And the historical consequence was that Catalina Swimwear got so pissed off, they withdrew as sponsors and started the competing Miss USA and, and which links to Miss Universe contest. And that of course is the one that Donald Trump owned for, I don't know, what was it about a decade that's often confused with Miss America. Uh, but it, it, Yolan Betbees's refusal changed the history of you know, the pageant lands, <laughs> landscape in this country. And Miss USA um, is really pretty different from Miss America, isn't it? It is different. It seems like even when it was established, they, they said, the, the, the founder said, this will be strictly about the body. We just want to see pretty ladies. So it didn't have all these attachments that Miss America had. The patriotism, the education, the platforms, the, um, the sort of fine citizenship that, that uh, comes and the sort of civic responsibility that comes with Miss America. And that is what made in my opinion, has made Miss America much more substantial uh, and, and more valuable in terms of historically actually providing women with funds for education through, through scholarships. It's fraught in, a, in many ways, but it is, historically, it has really tried to give women more than just money in reward for looking pretty. And in 1949, Lillian Ross wrote for the New Yorker uh, an article about the, the contest uh, called The Symbol of All We Possess. And I think that's kind of an interesting phrase, which I guess that comes from the song that was that they would sing at that time. Um, yeah, it was briefly the theme song. Um, and what does that really mean, the symbol of all we possess? I, you know, I wish I could call up the lyrics because that was such a, um, I felt like that was really telling what, uh, oh, sorry, I can't find it quickly and I don't want to slow us down. I think, uh, uh, oh, wait a minute, where do I have it? I think I can find it really quickly. Uh, there, okay, I've got it right here. Let's raise our glasses on high from coast to coast in this America as the sweetheart of the USA is passing by to a girl, to a girl, to a symbol of happiness, 
to the one, to the one who's the symbol of all we possess. Right. And there's so many key words there. A girl. She was, you know, she was girlish. Um, the, the symbol of all we possess, meaning representing this country. And so, you know, that's that meaning is depending on who's doing the interpreting of, of that phrase. Um, the emphasis on happiness is ongoing. This, you know, we think of Miss America, the Miss America smile and the wave, that, uh, that classic pageant wave. But the smiling is, has been there from the start. And I can't, I can't tell you how many times I, in doing research, I read, you know, people describing the women being told, smile, you know, smile throughout the whole pageant. Make sure you're smiling when the press arrives. Make sure you're smiling when you're walking past the judges. Uh, if you, you know, are having trouble answering a question, smile. If you're performing, smile. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, trying to play a violin, smile, <laughs> you know? And so this emphasis on happiness, that seems, I can't say why, but it seems very American, this notion of, of I guess, um, you know, foreigners do notice that we, we tend to be a very smiley culture and that's a piece of it. But also it's gendered women smile, we have, you know, it, the issue that has been so addressed in the media in recent years of women being catcalled and told to smile on the street and being expected to be available and pleasant, um, which also segues with behaviors that Miss America has been, uh, uh, that have been expected of Miss America. One Miss America, um, Elizabeth Ward in 83, I think she was, talks in the book and told me in our interview about feeling the pressure to be so accommodating and to make other people feel comfortable as Miss America and to sort of subvert her own desires and personality in the service of this externalized, ideal, pretty, sexy, nice womanhood that Miss America, she felt, promoted. Um, that all connects to the smiling as well. Yeah, and you think about how the the idea that there can be a kind of fake smile that conceals an inner turmoil. And that seems to be, I mean, in reading about, I read about, you know, uh, women who were participating who had eating disorders or who had been abused or, you know, I mean, who, who, who really had had a, a really tough time one way or another and were also having a tough time sort of being the, the beauty pageant contestant and, and, uh, putting themselves into that role. And uh, that really seems to sort of represent the larger culture where people sort of try to gloss over their difficulties, you know, and, and uh, uh, internalize. Yeah, and the one who comes to mind when you mention that smiling, regardless of what's happening is Marilyn Vanderber of uh, the late 50s, who had been, uh, sexually abused by her father from age, I guess, five to 18 or 19. She was competing in, I think, her early 20s. And just happened to be that that year when she won, the pageant organization decided to bring her, you know, bring the Miss America's family up on stage and let's show America what a wholesome, happy, healthy American family looks like. And she was forced to smile despite you know, what had been happening to her for decades. She was a, a really interesting Miss America who then went on to become an activist um, it, uh, against uh, incest and a advocate for inc incest survivors. Uh, she was also a, an early um, kind of a case study as someone who was a, a, what was the phrase? A repressed memory syndrome. She she didn't, you know, it, it came back to her after her Miss America years, but she talks in the book and in her own memoir about how uh, a lot of the sort of rigidity of being Miss America was her feeling locked into her own body and just trying to maintain control in this very um, sort of rigid way. 
but she was she was a really interesting substantial person who who talked about being sort of plunged into this at the beginning with no real idea of what kind of responsibility responsibility it entailed and also that it was a lonely job because you're traveling on your own you can't go home you're you're meeting and greeting 24/7 um, and and she was very honest in reflecting on it yet did not regret doing it she felt she benefited from it it appears the women's movement the growth of it in uh, in the united states really pushed the pageant uh to change but there was a lot of resistance so how, how would you characterize their response to the women's movement I think I say in the book that the, the pageant has always been in dialogue with feminism, but has never been in step with it. So it was always reactionary. The, the key moment when things changed was 1968, when feminists protested on the boardwalk outside the Miss America pageant, outside Convention Hall. And um, it was a, that was the, some of the funnest research because the protesters themselves were so excited about getting organized um, they talk, Flo Kennedy, activist of that period, talked about it being one of the single fondest days of her life. And they, uh, you know, they, they protested outside and then uh, demonstrated inside by unfurling a banner that said women's liberation, which was a term, you know, in circulation in feminist circles, but it wasn't a public term yet. And that gesture made it public. So uh, that was kind of a key moment in feminist history and sort of popular dissemination of popular feminist uh, impulses. But also it was a key moment in the Miss America history because they had to respond to this. They, they realized the culture is advancing and overtaking us. And that's about when their ratings started to drop. In the 70s, the ratings began a decline that has continued ever since with a couple of bumps here and there. And so some of the Miss Americas in the 70s were a little more progressive, uh, but for the most part, it remained very socially conservative. For, for example, to this day, if you track the Miss America talents, it's as if hip hop never happened. It's, it's this very kind of white bread, uh, traditional talent for the most part, classical music, ballet, and it's not reflective of the broader culture and also often not really reflective of gender diversity, especially today when uh, the, the kind of binary gender presentation that's rewarded at Miss America is not reflective of how many women present themselves today. I have a question for those Burt Parks fans out there. Why did they dump Burt Parks? What was going on then? I know it's it's a terrible thing because Burt Parks was truly Miss America. We we probably I think most people who knew it in its uh, you know in the in the mid twentieth century and mid to late twentieth century identify Burt Parks as a key component of Miss America. But what happened was uh, he in the, the then director's view was getting too old. I forget how old he was. Maybe he was uh, in his, I guess maybe about 60, I'm forgetting now, but- yeah, He was uh, probably older than he looked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. And he's the, you know, he's the one who sang the song and he was like the um, sort of like, well, I guess early on he was, cause he was a little closer in age to the women when he started, he was like a groom. Uh, you know, or, a, you know, an, an escort walking them across the stage and then he would send the winner down the runway uh, and sing the, the sing there she is to the winner. Uh, so he was so closely identified with them um, and with it. And people were really uh, upset that he was pretty unceremoniously um, sacked from the pageant. And then there, I don't think there's ever been a host since then who, there have been hosts that were popular or that who endured for years at a time, but I don't think anybody would identify any of those hosts with the pageant as they did Burt Park. Yeah, you know, the only times I watched the pageant when I was really pretty young, 
and it was always Burt Parks, and he was sort of like the pageant for me. I, I identified him with it, um, and I guess what was he? Was he replaced by John Davidson initially, or a bunch of different oh, people? Oh, I think John Davidson is the one they approached, who said, "Oh, he um, wouldn't do I wouldn't it. Say, I wouldn't sing that song if you paid me a million bucks." <laughs> <laughs> so he, he declined. But I think the next one was maybe Ron Ely, the uh, Tarzan. Tarzan. Yeah. And then like, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name. Uh, the Osmonds hosted at one point. Uh, there were a whole bunch of celebrity hosts throughout the years, but uh, nobody stayed as long as Burt Parks did. You had um, written in this book a lot about the problems the pageant had with racial diversity. And I come from a Native American uh, ancestry and your, your, what you wrote about their token Native American, uh, not contestants, so what did they call them? Uh, uh, they were guests. Yes, guests in their own nation. Um, that was uh, a very telling, uh, an indicator of where their racial diversity really lies. Yeah, that um, that was well put. Uh, that it's it, what happened was that the, the, by coincidence, the, one of the early Miss Americas was part Cherokee in the twenties, but she wasn't identified as Native American, and there was sort of a default racism at play. The the winners were overwhelmingly white women, and, and they would invite Native American women who came who had been winners of their own pageants in the West. Um, Jesse Jim was one who was a guest and they were presented on the stage. There's a photo in the book of a Miss America winning with a Native American guest uh, in her court. They, you know, they, there was a lot of this regal language already in play, even though the first Miss America was semi, a, a semi Lady Liberty figure and then evolved into more like a queen with a crown. But so there, there wasn't an enforced racism initially, it was, it was there, it was a default racism. And in the 30s and 40s, um, there were a couple of uh, Asian and Latina state contestants, but in, in the 1940s, this notorious rule number seven was actively instituted that said, contestants must be in good health and of the white race. That was under Lenora Slaughter, that director who was the, the very influential formative director who kind of designed it for the most part as we know it today. And that, that rule was on the books till the early 50s. But even when they scrapped that, that rule, and interestingly, she said, well, we can't really have black contestants because we don't know how to judge them fairly, which is, tantamount to saying we can't see their beauty so they can't compete in our pageant. Even after that rule was scrapped in the 50s, there wasn't a state contestant at the National Miss America contest till 1970, and then there wasn't a black winner till 1983, who was Vanessa Williams. But it is shocking to reflect, especially with this, this whole symbol of all we possess, like that can go both ways. We, we, it, it's intended to express the goodness we possess, but it's also expressing the racism that is, you know, core to our national identity and has defined us in so many ways as a nation. You mentioned Vanessa Williams and she had that scandal. Do you think any part of that scandal was racially motivated, motivated or was she, did she, hand the crown over to another black black woman? Yeah, it did happen that her runner up was black. And I, I don't think the scandal was racially motivated, but there was certainly tons of racism around her because of her win, that she, people didn't, you know, she, she was in physical danger as the first Miss Black America. And when she did her homecoming tour through her town in um, Chappaqua, New York, they had to mount sharpshooters on, you know, to, to protect her, to make sure that she wasn't um, a, a assaulted or I guess assassinated basically. 
And her, she and her family were the victim of just horrendous racial slurs and um, hostility and hatred. Uh, it was, it was, that was a really interesting barometer of racism in our country attached to this ritual that again expresses our national identity or what, what's intended as expressing, expressing national pride. It's ironic that she was, as far as I know, she's the only Miss America who had to step down, yet she's probably more famous and more accomplished than, than most of the contestants. But at, at the time that she stepped there, was asked to step down, was there, was there anybody sort of opposing that internally? Or was it everybody accepted that she really had to step down? I think there was some acknowledgement that, that it was a shame and that she, uh, one director, Leonard Horn made some, I don't think he was the director at the time. I think he had, he had previously stepped or resigned if I recall correctly, but he said something to the effect that it was clear she hadn't really done anything wrong, but that for the, uh, for the image of the pageant, they had to require her to resign. And of course people did, that may have been Albert Marx, I may be confusing my directors, but they, uh, they it, there was a lot of discussion about the fact that look, the hypocrisy here is amazing. You're asking women to get up here and strut around in swimsuits and suits and high heels and yet you're dethroning this woman because she posed for naked photos. And the question of like, where is the line between these two things in terms of sexualizing young women on, on, in a, on a national platform? But she I, is really, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, I guess those were also photos that she never thought anybody was gonna see. Right, yeah. And she said that she had never signed, she had never licensed them to be used and the photographer claimed that she did sign them away. Uh, but yeah, you're right. She's really interesting as someone who is, she probably could have gotten where she is today without the pageant because she was so talented and so personable. And so she's one of the, the Miss Americas who, you know, you think of most Miss Americas finding their way th through the stepping stone of the pageant, their way to fame or their way to a career. Uh, in whatever they want to do, not necessarily entertainment. For some people, it you know it's been becoming a doctor or a lawyer or uh, a designer. Uh, but in her case, she she it wasn't so much that the Miss America pageant enabled that. In, in fact, the Miss America pageant uh, was an obstacle in that course. But she could have done it regardless. So she's one of the few who sort of made her fame in spite of the pageant rather than because of the pageant. Was Another been... person that made uh, a, a good career out of the pageant, Phyllis George. I went to college with Phyllis and oh, at North Texas. We were in the same class and I got to be her serving boy in the sorority dormitory. Sororities didn't <laughs> have a dormitory. The uh, fraternities all had their fraternity houses. They were able to be all animal house about it, but uh, women were not allowed to even be seen entering an off-campus, you know, residence. So they all lived in the dorm, and I was a serving boy in the cafeteria. And of course, I, <laughs> I was invisible, but uh, I saw her and her entourage occasionally, and uh, she seemed to be fairly nice you it wasn't like a lot of a, a lot of the uh, sorority folks were you know pretty nasty but she seemed to be a very nice person but she was uh, conflicted i believe uh you mean about the pageant or in, yes <laughs> in college? yeah because she was a uh she was one of the most successful miss americas and went on to a career as a sports journalist and I, I think she was, fr from what I read in her mem memoir, I didn't interview her for the book, I quoted from her, her memoir, uh, she seemed like someone who was driven and smart and was not afraid to express her opinions. And she was crowned in the, I forget what her year was, but early 70s. Um, she was, this was a time when they relaxed the rules against uh, that that 
forbade women to talk about politics. In the 60s, they were told, you can't talk about politics, you can't talk about the war, you can't talk about drugs, uh, you can't talk about sex before marriage, you need to keep this to yourselves. And then finally, they realized that was one of the things that was keeping them behind the times. Finally, in the 70s, the women were invited to be more public about their views. And she was uh, very forthright about what she thought. I mean, her views were somewhat conservative, but she, she was uh, not afraid to say what she thought. Um, I'm kind of interested in what uh, Miss America has to do over the year of her reign and, and whether that's changed over the years. Yeah, I mean, it has changed in the, I, I know like in the 80s, um, Elizabeth Ward, who I mentioned before, who now, uh, her name is Elizabeth Grayson, she talked about winning uh, between the scholarship, which has stalled out now at $50,000 for decades, but she, she won the, the scholarship and then sponsorship money and made about $150,000 in the early 80s, which was good money. And so, but she said, you know, it was a lot of, at that time, it was going around doing these public events. Some of them were paid, well, mo actually they were all paid. That's how she made that kind of money. Uh, but in the recent decades, the, those kind of sponsorships have declined. So, uh, I, you know, to be honest, I'm not really sure how the scheduling works now that the, the pageant doesn't seem to have a lot of money and little pieces of it have been removed, you know, in, in terms of staff. I was surprised when I started doing my research and approached the Miss America organization and, and learned that there were only four or five people who were full-time employees there. It was also really hard to just get a, a return phone call. Their, their machine was on all the time. So I think they're pretty strapped. Um, the interesting thing is that some state pageants are so well-funded that it's worth it to some state winners to stop at that level because they can get money. I think I quote one winner getting 70 or $80,000 and but, but then they don't have to serve a year as Miss America. They can either be serving in their state while they're continuing to go to college or doing whatever they were doing uh, and get the money. So it's like the best of both worlds. It tends to be better funded in the, in the Southern states and that makes that possible. Well, at the height of it, when, when they were pretty busy year round, uh, what kind of engagements did they have? Was it kind of transformative for them and the kinds of things that they had to do and how busy well, they were and so forth? Some of it, I forget who it was, talked about how boring it was to sit around in like Chrysler dealerships and, and you know, like that you'd get on, I forget who this was, had to sit on a throne for hours in a car dealership and sign autographs. Or like Vanessa Williams, I have a, a photo uh, that a friend of mine gave me. I, I talk in the book about how meaningful it was to so many black women when Vanessa Williams was crowned, even to women who weren't necessarily into pageants. Um, a friend of mine who I teach with shared some photos of, with me of Vanessa Williams at a mall in New Jersey where she went to see her. And so that was kind of a classic Miss America event, showing up at a mall being seated at a table and just signing and signing and signing and signing for hours and greeting, you know, greeting and meeting her fans. So, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was sponsorships. In some cases, it was advertising. In the early years, they advertised um, cigars and, and hand creams and, uh, and cars. And then there became a sort of an intertwining of Miss America herself and the products when, in 1954, when the first televised Miss America happened, um, soon after there was a Miss America branded TV. And then there was a Miss America Barbie in uh, the 60s, I guess she emerged. Uh, but there's a great image of Vanessa Williams on a collectible box of cornflakes. So the Miss Americas would be, um, you know, their portrait would appear on cornflakes. Um. I'm wondering, uh, I know we're getting close to uh, running out of time, but uh, I'm kind of interested in, in the Gretchen Carlson's 
connection with Miss America. She was a former Miss America and eventually she became director or CEO for a while. And then uh, apparently uh, that didn't work out too well. How, uh, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I have no idea. I've never seen a, a, a clear explanation of why she stepped down but it appears to be because there was so much controversy about the changes she made. Not just the getting rid of the swimsuit, but renaming it um, a competition, no longer a pageant, defining it as a professional opportunity, not, not a, a, a pageant, not, a, not, a, 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 not a, a sort of crown of beauty. And um, she also, uh, announced that broader body types would be uh, acceptable. I think also one thing that pe some pageant diehards really hated was that she didn't require the gown anymore. So that even some people who thought, okay, we can see why the swimsuit might be a bit much, but what's wrong with the gown? The gown is, you know, the, the, the glamour of the whole thing is wrapped up in the gown and, you know, we want to see this fashion component of it that's been a big piece of it from the start. So initially, I mean, when I was at that that pageant, that 2018 pageant with the, that was a transitional pageant where all these changes were implemented. Oh, the other thing was uh, they didn't walk down a runway. They just sort of the winner, uh, Nia Franklin that year, just stood on the stage. And so some people just hated that. And I think it caused such a rift in the leadership that she had to step down or maybe she just didn't want the headache of, of, of all that. And also she had, um, uh, she's the one who brought down Roger Ailes at Fox News for sexual harassment. Right. So it's also possible she just had bigger fish to fry at that point in terms of the activism that she's done around that. So who's running the show over there now? What, what's the state of the pageant today? Uh, it seems very disorganized. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, you know, there's word that there will be a 100th anniversary pageant, which I, I can't imagine they would not do that when it's so close to that, that landmark. But there's been, you know, the, this past year pageant has not happened because of COVID. There, so the current winner, Camille Schreier, has had to serve two years. And, and she's also one of the, um, representative of the change that you know the progress that has happened in the past year because that year that she won she did not have to do a performing arts kind of a talent she did a science demonstration and she was a biochemistry major at I think Virginia Tech and she uh you know represented a change away from emphasizing looks and performance in an entertainment sense. So she's serving her, her second year and I just don't really have any sense of when or where it will happen next year, especially because um, when, when she was crowned, the pageant happened in a casino in Connecticut, not the Atlantic City wouldn't host it any longer. They had subsidized it. The, I think it's the Casino Development Fund had funded it to the tune of many millions of dollars and they finally pulled the plug and said we can't do this anymore so they had to leave and who knows where it will be if the 100th anniversary happens or when that will happen and of course covid is a factor there as well i wonder how the transformation of media uh, over the last several years like a couple of decades has had an impact on on the pageant and our thinking about it. It, it seems like um, there's so many other challenges to somebody's attention. So, so many other ways that people can sort of channel their energies that uh, I would think they have trouble finding an audience, especially considering that they're kind of a relic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and social media is such a useful tool for achieving all the the types of things that pageantry historically achieved. I mean, there, on one hand, historically, the pageant was useful to women in the first half of the 20th century who didn't have the kind of opportunities they have now. And so 
it made sense to trade on their beauty to get the opportunities that were denied to them in a professional sense. But now it's, you know, it's not like we live in a totally egalitarian society, but it's a lot better. Women have more opportunities. And so I sometimes wonder why women need to do this for opportunity. Many of the women I interviewed gave me very good explanations for why they had done it. They had won scholarship money that to them made it valuable to them. Or they felt like even, <clears throat> even if they didn't win a lot financially, that it was worth it to them for the professional training they got in, in sort of you know dealing with the media and being public figures. And also, I'll just add a third thing that I learned that going back to the beginning of our conversation, was I a fan and what did I think about it and being shocked to discover it on TV. For some people, it's a, a kind of a social network that there's there's a very social aspect to it. Generations of women who have competed or families who've participated in it uh, have connected with each other. And some of them I met at, uh, you know, at pageants and, and sort of saw what they were talking about in action in their uh, engagement with each other. So it, uh, I, I forgot the question again, I'm sorry. I was, I was talking about the, the history the changes, where it's going. Well, I was starting to think about another thing about how just kind of the way we think and feel about gender now has changed so much. It seems like this is really kind of an antique, right? It, it, uh, it, and in changing with the times, it's changed to something that doesn't feel as relevant, perhaps. Yeah, I think so in the sense that, you know, both in terms of the kind of gender presentation that is rewarded, uh, as I was saying earlier, doesn't really reflect women's gender identity today. And also that people have other platforms, like, you know, you talk about the social issues component of, or the, um, the platform that was added in, in 1990. They, there's another term for it now. They, that same year, Gretchen Carlson, a lot of the language was revised. But I think it's called social issues, not platform. And women can get that platform through activism, through social media, in a way that they don't have to, that doesn't require them to compete with each other on a stage against other women. I think that's the other piece of it that's antiquated, is the idea that you isolate women and make them compete with each other for scholarships, which is the, you know, the grand prize. Well, why don't men have to do this? <laughs> you know, that's that's one of the double standards that seems outdated at this point. Well, I think that we uh, we've been going for almost an hour now, um, so it's time to conclude our talk. But this has just been wonderful. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed it, and you you both asked excellent questions. So oh, thank you. Pleasure. You may follow Margot Mifflin at margomifflin.com. Her book, Looking for Miss America, A Pageant's 100-Year Quest to Define Womanhood, is available on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, and Bookshop. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future. <laughs>